Welcome to episode 12 of the Catholics Against Militarism podcast. We had a guest cancel this week due to some technical issues. And so since it's October 4th, the feast day of St. Francis of Assisi, I thought I would go ahead and just read a few excerpts from G.K. Chesterton's biography um, called St. Francis of Assisi. It was my introduction to St. Francis, um, and it's a really great book if you've never read it. In the first couple of chapters, he writes about the problem of St. Francis, and then he puts St. Francis in historical context in a chapter called The World St. Francis Found. But I'm going to start in, chapters, in chapter three, which is called Francis the Fighter. And once again, I'm only reading excerpts, so I am skipping a little, around a little bit just so, to, so as to make it more concise. Um, but here we go. One of the earliest glimpses we have of St. Francis shows him as simply selling bales of cloth from a booth in the market. This first glimpse of the young man in the market is symbolic in more ways than one. While he was selling velvet and fine embroideries to some solid merchant of the town, a beggar came imploring alms, evidently in a somewhat tactless manner. It was a rude and simple society, and there were no laws to punish a starving man for expressing his need for food, such as have been established in more humanitarian ages. And the lack of any organized police permitted such persons to pester the wealthy without any great danger." But there was, I believe, in many places a local custom of the guild forbidding outsiders to interrupt a fair bargain, and it is possible that some such thing put the mendicant more than normally in the wrong. Francis had all his life a great liking for people who had been put hopelessly in the wrong. On this occasion, he seems to have dealt with the double interview with rather a divided mind, certainly with distraction, possibly with irritation. Perhaps he was all the more uneasy because of the almost fastidious standard of manners that came to him quite naturally. All are agreed that politeness flowed from him from the first, like one of the public fountains in such a sunny Italian marketplace. He might have written among his own poems, as his own motto, that verse of Mr. Belloc's poem, Of courtesy it is much less than courage of heart or holiness, yet in my walks it seems to me that the grace of God is in courtesy. If there was one thing of which so humble a man could be said to be proud, he was proud of good manners. Only behind his perfectly natural urbanity were wider and even wilder possibilities, of which we get the first flash in this trivial incident. Anyhow, Francis finished his business with the merchant somehow, and when he had finished it, found the beggar was gone. Francis leapt from his booth, left all the bales of velvet and embroidery behind him, apparently unprotected, and went racing across the marketplace like an arrow from the bow. Still running, he threaded the labyrinth of the narrow and crooked streets of the little town, looking for his beggar, whom he eventually discovered, and loaded that astonished mendicant with money. Then he straightened himself, so to speak, and swore before God that he would never in all his life re refuse to help a poor man. He had not anything of that early sense of his vocation that has belonged to some of the saints. Over and above his main ambition to win fame as a French poet, he would seem to have most often thought of winning fame as a soldier. He was born kind. He was brave in the normal boyish fashion. But he drew the line both in kindness and bravery pretty well where most boys would have drawn it. For instance, he had the human horror of leprosy of which few normal people felt any need to be ashamed. He had the love of gay and bright apparel which was inherent in the heraldic taste of medieval times and seems altogether to have been a rather festive figure. But in this story of the young man in gay garments scampering after the vanishing beggar, in rags, there are certain notes of his natural individuality that must be assumed from first to last. For instance, there is the spirit of swiftness. In a sense, he continued running for the rest of his life as he ran after the beggar because nearly all the errands he ran were errands of mercy. This saint should be represented among the other saints as angels were sometimes represented in pictures of angels, with flying feet or even with feathers, in the spirit of the text that makes angels' wings and messengers a flaming fire. It is a curiosity of language that courage actually means running. Some might call him a madman, but he was the very reverse of a dreamer. Nobody would be likely to call him a man of business, but he was very emphatically a man of action. At every turn of his extraordinary career, we shall find him flinging himself around corners in the most unexpected fashion, as when he th flew through the crooked streets after the beggar. 
Another element implied in the story, which was already partially a natural instinct before it became a supernatural ideal, was something that had never perhaps been wholly lost in those little republics of medieval Italy. It was something very puzzling to some people, something clearer as a rule to Southerners than to Northerners, and I think to Catholics than Protestants. The quite natural assumption of the equality of men. It has nothing necessarily to do with the Franciscan love for men. On the contrary, one of its merely practical tests is the equality of the duel. Perhaps a gentleman will never be fully an egalitarian until he can really quarrel with his servant. But it was an antecedent condition of the Franciscan Brotherhood, and we feel it in this early and secular incident. Francis, I fancy, felt a real doubt about which he must attend to, the beggar or the merchant, and having attended to the merchant, he turned to attend to the beggar. He thought of them as two men. St. Francis is not a proper person to be patronized with merely pretty stories. There are any number of them, but they are too often used so as to be a sort of sentimental sediment of the medieval world, instead of being, as the saint emphatically is, a challenge to the modern world. We must take his real human development somewhat more seriously, and the next story in which we get a real glimpse of it is in a very different setting. But in exactly the same way it opens, as if by accident, certain abysses of the mind and perhaps of the unconscious mind. Francis still looks more or less like an ordinary young man, and it is only when we look at him as an ordinary young man that we realize what an extraordinary young man he must be. War had broken out between Assisi and Perugia. It is now fashionable to say in a satirical spirit that such wars did not so much break out as go on indefinitely between the city-states of medieval Italy. It will be enough to say here that if one of these medieval wars had really gone on without stopping for a century, it might possibly have come within a a remote distance of killing as many people as we kill in a year in one of our great modern scientific wars between our great modern industrial empires. But the citizens of the medieval republic were certainly under the limitation of only being asked to die for the things with which they had always lived, the houses they inhabited, the shrines they venerated, and the rulers and representatives they knew, and had not the larger vision calling them to die for the latest rumors about remote colonies as reported in anonymous newspapers. And if we infer from our own experience that war paralyzed civilization, we must at least admit that these warring towns turned out a number of paralytics who go by the names of Dante and Michelangelo, Aristo and Titian, Leonardo and Columbus, not to mention St. Catherine of Siena, and the subject of this story. Anyhow, the toxin was wrong in Assisi, and the citizens armed, and among them Francis, the son of the cloth merchant. He went out to fight with some company of lancers, and in some fight or foray or other, he and his little band were taken prisoners. To me it seems most probable that there had been some tale of treason or cowardice about the disaster, for we are told that there was one of the captives with whom his fellow prisoners flatly refused to associate, even in prison. And when this happens in such circumstances, it is, it is generally because the military blame for the surrender is thrown on some individual. Anyhow, somebody noted a small but curious thing, though it might seem rather negative than positive. Francis, we are told, moved among his captive companions with all his characteristic courtesy and even conviviality, quote, liberal and hilarious, unquote, as somebody said of him, resolved to keep up their spirits and his own. And when he came across the mysterious outcast, traitor or coward or whatever he was called, he simply treated him exactly like all the rest, neither with coldness nor compassion, but with the same unaffected gaiety and good fellowship. But if there had been present in that prison someone with a sort of second sight about the truth and trend of spiritual things, he might have known he was in the presence of something new and seemingly almost anarchic, a deep tide driving out to uncharted seas of charity. For in this sense, there was really something wanting in St. Francis, something to which he was blind that he might see better and more beautiful things. All those limits in good fellowship and good form all those landmarks of social life that divide the tolerable and the intolerable, all those social scruples and conventional conditions that are normal and even noble in ordinary men, 
all those things that hold many decent societies together could never hold this man at all. He liked as he liked. He seems to have liked everybody, but especially those whom everybody disliked him for liking. But though such a seer might have seen such a truth, it is exceedingly doubtful if Francis himself saw it. He had acted out of an unconscious largeness, or in the fine medieval phrase, largesse, within himself, something that might almost have been lawless if it had not been reaching out to a more divine law. But it is doubtful whether he yet knew that the law was divine. It is evident that he had not at this time any notion of abandoning the military, still less of adopting the monastic life. It is true that there is not, as pacifists and prigs imagine, the least inconsistency between loving men and fighting them, if we fight them fairly and for a good cause. But it seems to me that there was more than this involved, that the mind of the young man was really running towards a military morality in any case. About this time, the first calamity crossed his path in the form of a malady, which was to revisit him many times and hamper his headlong career. Sickness made him more serious, but one fancies it would have only made him a more serious soldier, or even more serious about soldiering. And while he was recovering, something rather larger than the little feuds and raids of the Italian towns opened up an avenue of adventure and ambition— the crown of Sicily, a considerable center of controversy at the time, was apparently claimed by a certain Gauthier de Brienne, and the papal cause to aid which Gauthier was called in aroused enthusiasm among, among, a, mum, among a number of young Assisians, including Francis, who proposed to march into Apulia on the count's behalf. Perhaps his French name had something to do with it. For it must never be forgotten that though the world was in one sense a world of little things— it was a world of little things concerned about great things. There was more internationalism in the lands dotted with tiny republics than in the huge, homogeneous, impenetrable national divisions of today. Above all, it must be remembered that when the interests of an age are mainly religious, they must be universal. Nothing could be more universal than the universe. And there are several things about the religious position at that particular moment which modern people not unnaturally fail to realize. For one thing, we feel vaguely that these things happened in the first ages of the church. The church was already a good deal more than a thousand years old. That is, the church was then rather older than France is now, a great deal older than England is now. And she looked old then, almost as old as she does now, possibly older than she does now. The church looked like great Charlemagne with the long white beard who had already fought a hundred wars with the heathen and in the legend was bidden by an angel to go forth and fight once more, though he was 200 years old. The church had topped her thousand years and turned the corner of the second thousand. She had come through the dark ages in which nothing could be done except desperate fighting against the barbarians and the stubborn repetition of the creed. The creed was still being repeated after the victory or escape, but it is not unnatural to suppose that there was something a little monotonous about the repetition. The church looked old then as now, and there were some who thought her dying then as now. In truth, orthodoxy was not dead, but it may have been dull. It is certain that some people began to think it dull. It is likely enough that after all those centuries of hopeless war, without and ruthless asceticism within, the official orthodoxy seemed to be something stale. The freshness and freedom of the first Christians seemed then, as much as now, a lost and almost prehistoric age of gold. Rome was still more rational than anything else. The church was really wiser, but it may well have seemed wearier than the world. Only the light lay on the great plain round Rome, but the light was blank and the plain was flat, and there was no stir in the still air, and the immemorial silence about the sacred town. High in the dark house of Assisi, Francesco Bernadone slept and dreamed of arms. There came to him in the darkness a vision splendid with swords, patterned after the cross in the crusading fashion of spears and shields and helmets, hung in a high armory, all bearing the sacred sign. When he awoke, he accepted the dream as a trumpet, bidding him to the battlefield, and rushed out to take horse and arms. 
he delighted in all the exercises of chivalry and was evidently an accomplished cavalier and fighting man by the tests of the tournament and the camp. He would doubtless at any time have, have preferred a Christian sort of chivalry, but it seems clear that he was also in a mood which thirsted for glory, though in him that glory would always have been identical with honor. He was not without some vision of that wreath of laurel which Caesar had left for all the Latins. As he rode out to war, the great gate in the deep wall of Assisi resounded with his last boast, I shall come back a great prince. A little way along his road, his sickness rose again and threw him. It seems highly probable, in the light of his impetuous temper, that he had ridden away long before he was fit to move. And in the darkness of this second and far more desolating interruption, he seems to have had another dream in which a voice said to him, You have mistaken the meaning of the vision. Return to your own town. And Francis trailed back in his sickness to Assisi, a very dismal and disappointed, and perhaps even derided figure, with nothing to do but to wait for what should happen next. It was his first descent into a dark ravine that is called the Valley of Humiliation, which seemed to him a very rocky and desolate valley, but in which he was afterwards to find many flowers. But he was not only disappointed and humiliated, he was also very much puzzled and bewildered. He still firmly believed that his two dreams must have been something, and he could not imagine what they could possibly mean. It was while he was drifting, one may even say mooning, about the streets of Assisi and the fields outside the city wall that an incident occurred to him which has not always been immediately connected with the business of the dreams, but which seems to me the obvious culmination of them. He was riding listlessly in some wayside place, apparently in the open country, when he saw a figure coming along the road towards him and halted for he saw it was a leper. And he knew instantly that his courage was challenged, not as the world challenges, but as one would challenge who knew the secrets of the heart of a man. What he saw advancing was not the banner and spears of Perugia, from which it never occurred to him to shrink, not the armies that fought for the crown of Sicily, of which he had always thought as a courageous man thinks of mere vulgar danger. Francis Bernadone saw his fear coming up the road towards him, the fear that comes from within and not from without, though it stood white and horrible in the sunlight. For once in the long rush of his life, his soul must have stood still. Then he sprang from his horse, knowing nothing between swiftness and stillness, and rushed on the leper and threw his arms around him. It was the beginning of a long vocation of ministry among many lepers, for whom he did many services. To this man he gave what money he could and mounted and rode on. We do not know how far he rode or with what sense of things around him, but it is said that when he looked back, he could see no figure on the road. I will read just a, a couple paragraphs of the next chapter called um, Francis the Builder. We have now reached the great break in the life of Francis of Assisi, the point at which something happened to him that must remain greatly dark to most of us, who are ordinary and selfish men whom God has not broken to make anew. In dealing with this difficult passage, especially for my own purpose of making things moderately easy for the more secular sympathizer, I have hesitated as to the proper course and have eventually decided to state first of all what happened with little more than a hint of what I imagined to have been the meaning of what happened. The fuller meaning may be debated more or easily afterwards when it was unfolded in the full Franc Franciscan life. Anyhow, what happened was this. The story very largely revolves around the ruins of the Church of St. Damien, an old shrine in Assisi which was apparently neglected and falling to pieces. Here Francis was in the habit of praying before the crucifix during these dark and aimless days of transition that followed the tragical collapse of all his military ambitions, probably made bitter by some loss of social prestige terrible to a sensitive spirit. As he did so, he heard a voice saying to him, Francis, seest thou not that my house is in ruins? Go and restore it for me. Francis sprang up and went. 
Okay, so now I'm skipping ahead to chapter, he builds the church, um, and I'm sk skipping ahead to chapter 7 called The Three Orders. Uh, the good bishop of Assisi expressed a sort of horror at the hard life with which the little brothers lived, without comforts, without possessions, eating anything they could get, and sleeping anyhow on the ground. St. Francis answered him with that curious and almost stunning shrewdness which the unworldly can sometimes wield like a club of stone. He said, if we had any possessions, we should need weapons and laws to defend them. That sentence is the clue to the whole policy that he pursued. It rested upon a real piece of logic, and about that he was never anything but logical. He was ready to own himself wrong about anything else, but he was quite certain he was right about this particular rule. He was only once seen angry, and that was when there was talk of an exception being made to the rule. His argument was this, that the dedicated man might go anywhere among any kind of men, even the worst kind of men, so long as there was nothing by which they could hold him. If he had any ties or needs like ordinary men, he would become like ordinary men. St. Francis was the last man in the world to think any the worse of ordinary men for being ordinary. They had more affection and admiration from him than they are ever likely to have again. But for his own particular purpose of stirring up the world to a new spiritual enthusiasm, he saw with a logical clarity that was quite reverse of fanatical or sentimental, that friars must not become like ordinary men, that the salt must not lose its savor, even to turn into human nature's daily food. And the difference between a friar and an ordinary man was really that a friar was freer than an ordinary man. It was necessary that he should be free from the cloister, but it was even more important that he should be free from the world. It is perfectly sound common sense to say that there is a sense in which the ordinary man cannot be free from the world, or rather ought not to be free from the world. The feudal world in particular was one labyrinthian system of dependence, but it was not only the feudal world that went to make up the medieval world, nor the medieval world that went to make up the whole world, and the whole world is full of this fact. Family life, as much as feudal life, is in its nature a system of dependence. Modern trade unions, as much as medieval guilds, are interdependent among themselves, even in order to be independent of others. In medieval, as in modern life, even where these limitations do exist for the sake of liberty, they have in them a considerable element of luck. They are partly the result of circumstances, sometimes the almost unavoidable result of circumstances. So the 12th century had been an age of vows, and there was something of relative freedom in that feudal gesture of the vow, for no man asks vows from slaves any more than from spades. Still, in practice, a man rode to war in support of the ancient house of the column, or behind the great dog of the stairway, largely because he had been born in a certain city or in a certain country. But no man need obey little Francis in the old brown coat unless he chose. Even in his relations with his chosen leader, he was in one sense relatively free compared with the world around him. He was obedient, but not dependent, and he was as free as the wind. He was almost wildly free in his relation to that world around him. The world around him was, as has been noted, a network of feudal and family and other forms of dependence. The whole idea of St. Francis was that the little brothers should be like little fishes who could go freely in and out of that net. They could do so precisely because they were small fishes, and in that sense, even slippery fishes. There was nothing that the world could hold them by, for the world catches us mostly by the fringes of our garments, the futile externals of our lives. One of the Franciscans says later, a monk should own nothing but his harp, meaning, I suppose, that he should value nothing but his song, the song with which it was his business as a minstrel to serenade every castle and cottage, the song of the joy of the Creator in his creation, and the beauty of the brotherhood of men. In imagining the life of this sort of visionary vagabond, we may already get a glimpse also of the practical side of that asceticism, which puzzles those who think themselves practical. A man had to be thin to pass always through the bars and out of the cage. He had to travel light in order to ride so fast and so far. It was the whole calculation, so to speak, of that innocent cunning that the world was to be outflanked and outwitted by him and be embarrassed about what to do with him. You could not threaten to starve a man who was ever striving to fast. You could not ruin him and reduce him to beggary, for he was already a beggar. There was a very lukewarm satisfaction even in beating him with a stick 
when he only indulged in little leaps and cries of joy because indignity was his only dignity. You could not put his head in a halter without the risk of putting it in a halo. And now in chapter 8, called The Mirror of Christ, Chesterton shows us just how far St. Francis of Assisi eventually came uh, from being that young man who rode out on a horse hoping to find glory in war. All sorts of critical controversies have revolved around the passage which bids men consider the lilies of the field and copy them in taking no thought for the morrow. The skeptic has alternated between telling us to be true Christians and do it and explaining that it is just impossible to do. When he is a communist as well as an atheist, he is generally doubtful whether to blame us for preaching what is impracticable or for not instantly putting it into practice. I'm not going to discuss here the point of ethics and economics. I merely remark that even those who are puzzled at the saying of Christ would hardly pause in accepting it as a saying of St. Francis. Nobody would be surprised to find that he had said, quote, I beseech you, little brothers, that you be as wise as Brother Daisy and Brother Dandelion, for never do they lie awake thinking of tomorrow, yet they have gold crowns like kings and emperors, or like Charlemagne in all his glory, unquote. Even more bitterness and bewilderment has arisen about the command to turn the other cheek and to give the coat to the robber who has taken the cloak. It is widely held to imply the wickedness of war among nations, about which in itself not a word seems to have been said. Taken thus literally and universally, it much more clearly implies the wickedness of all law and government. Yet there are many prosperous peacemakers who are much more shocked at the idea of using the Bruce Ford of a brute force of a soldier against a powerful foreigner than they are at using the brute force of policemen against a poor citizen. Here again, I am content to point out that the paradox becomes perfectly human and probable if addressed by Francis to Franciscans. Nobody would be surprised to read that Brother Juniper did then run after the thief that had stolen his hood, beseeching him to take his gown also, for so St. Francis had commanded him. Nobody would be surprised if St. Francis told a young noble about to be admitted to his company that so far from pursuing a brigand to recover his shoes, he ought to pursue him to make him a present of his stockings. We may like or not the atmosphere these things imply, but we know what atmosphere they do imply. We recognize a certain note as natural and clear as the note of a bird the note of St. Francis. There is in it something of gentle mockery of the very idea of possessions, something of a hope of disarming the enemy by generosity, something of a humorous sense of bewildering the worldly with the unexpected, something of the joy of carrying an enthusiastic conviction to a logical extreme. But anyhow, we have no difficulty in recognizing it if we have read any of the literature of the Little Brothers and the movement that began in Assisi. It seems reasonable to infer that if it was this spirit that made such strange things possible in Umbria, it was the same spirit that made them possible in Palestine. If we hear the same unmistakable note and sense the same indescribable savor in two things at such a distance from each other, it seems natural to suppose that the case that is more remote from our experience was like the case that is closer to our experience. And the thing is explicable on the is, ex is, sorry, is explicable on the assumption that Francis was speaking to Franciscans. It is not an irrational explanation to suggest that Christ also was speaking to some dedicated band that had much the same function as Franciscans. In other words, it seems only natural to hold, as the Catholic Church has held, that these councils of perfection were part of a particular vocation to astonish and awaken the world. But in any case, it is important to note that when we do find these particular features with their seemingly fantastic fitness reappearing after more than a thousand years, we find them produced by the same religious system which claims continuity and authority from the scenes in which they first appeared. Any number of philosophies will repeat the platitudes of Christianity, but it is, it is the ancient church that can again startle the world with the paradoxes of Christianity. Where Peter is there is Francis. But if we understand that it was truly under the inspiration of his divine master that St. Francis did these merely quaint or eccentric acts of charity, we must understand that it was under the same inspiration that he did acts of self-denial and austerity. It is clear that these more or less playful parables of the love of men 
were conceived after a close study of the Sermon on the Mount. But it is evident that he made an even closer study of the silent sermon on that other mountain, the mountain that was called Golgotha. Here again he was speaking the the strict historical truth, when he said that in fasting or suffering humiliation he was but trying to do something of what Christ did. And here again it seems probable that as the same truth appears at the two ends of a chain of tradition, the tradition has preserved the truth. But the important but the import of this fact at the moment affects the next phase in the personal history of the man himself. For as it becomes clearer that his great communal scheme is an accomplished fact, and the path and past the peril of an early collapse, as it becomes evident that there already is such a thing as an order of the Friars Minor, this more individual and intense ambition of St. Francis emerges more and more. So soon as he certainly has followers, he does not compare himself with his followers towards whom he might appear as a master. He compares himself more and more with his master, towards whom he appears only as a servant. This, it may be said in passing, is one of the moral and even practical conveniences of the ascetical privilege. Every other sort of superiority may be superciliousness, but the saint is never supercilious, for he is always by hypothesis in the presence of a superior. The objection to an aristocracy is that it is a priesthood without a god, but in any case, the service to which St. Francis has committed himself was one which, about this time, he conceived more and more in terms of sacrifice and crucifixion. He was full of the sentiment that he had not suffered enough to be worthy even to be a distant follower of his suffering God, and this passage in his history may really be roughly summarized as the search for martyrdom. This was the ultimate idea in the remarkable business of his expedition among the Saracens in Syria. There were indeed other elements in his conception which are worthy of more intelligent understanding than they have often been received. His idea, of course, was to bring the Crusades in a double sense to their end, that is, to reach their conclusion and to achieve their purpose. Only he wished to do it by conversion and not by conquest, that is, by intellectual and not material means. The modern mind is hard to please, and it generally calls the way of Godfrey, Godfrey ferocious and the way of Francis fanatical. That is, it calls any moral method unpractical when it has just called any practical method immoral. But the idea of St. Francis was far from being a fanatical or necessarily even an unpractical idea, though he perhaps saw the problem as rather too simple, lacking the learning of his great inheritor, Raymond Lully, who understood more but has been quite as little understood. The way he approached the matter was indeed highly personal and peculiar, but that was true of almost everything he did. It was in one way a simple idea, as most of his ideas were simple ideas, but it was not a silly idea. There was a great deal to be said for it. It might have succeeded. It was, of course, simply the idea that it is better to create Christians than to destroy Muslims. If Islam had been converted, the world would have been immeasurably more united and happy. For one thing, three-quarters of the wars of modern history would never have taken place. It was not absurd to suppose that this might be effected without military force by missionaries who were also martyrs. The Church had conquered Europe in that way, and may yet conquer Asia or Africa in that way. But when all this is allowed for, there is still another sense in which St. Francis was not thinking of martyrdom as a means to an end, but almost as an end in itself, in the sense that, to him, the supreme end was to come closer to the example of Christ. Through all his plunging and restless days ran the refrain, I have not suffered enough, I have not sacrificed enough, I am not yet worthy even of the shadow of the crown of thorns. He wandered about the valleys of the world looking for the hill, that has the outline of a skull. A little while before his departure for the east, a vast and triumphant assembly of the whole order had been near the Pornicula and called the assembly of the straw huts from the manner in which that mighty army encamped in the field. Tradition says that it was on this occasion that St. Francis met St. Dominic for the first and last time. It also says what is probable enough, that the practical spirit of the Spaniard was almost appalled at the devout irresponsibility of the Italian, 
who had assembled such a crowd without organizing a commissariat. Dominic the Spaniard was, like nearly every Spaniard, a man with the mind of a soldier. His charity took the practical form of provision and preparation. But apart from the disputes about faith, which such incidents open, he probably did not understand in this case the power of more mere popularity produced by mere personality. In all his leaps in the dark, Francis had an extraordinary faculty of falling on his feet. The whole countryside came down like a landslide to provide food and drink for this sort of pious picnic. Peasants brought wagons of wine and game. Great nobles walked about doing the work of footmen. It was a very real victory for the Franciscan spirit of a reckless faith, not only in God, but in man. Of course, there is much doubt and dispute about the whole story and the whole relation of Francis and Dominic, and the story of the assembly of the straw huts is told from the Franciscan side. But the alleged meeting is worth mentioning, precisely because it was immediately before St. Francis set forth on his bloodless crusade that he is said to have met St. Dominic, who has been so much criticized for lending himself to a more bloody one. There is no space in this little book to explain how St. Francis, as much as St. Dominic, would ultimately have defended the defense of Christian unity by arms. Indeed, it would need a large book instead of a little book to develop that point alone from its first principles. But while it is probable that St. Francis would have reluctantly agreed with St. Dominic that war for the truth was right in the last resort, it is certain that St. Dominic did enthusiastically agree with St. Francis that it was far better to prevail by persuasion and enlightenment if it were possible. St. Dominic devoted himself much more to persuading than to persecuting, but there was a difference in the methods simply because there was a difference in the men. About everything St. Francis did, there was something that was in a good sense childish, and even a good sense willful. He threw himself into things abruptly, as if they had just occurred to him. He made a dash for his Mediterranean enterprise with something of the air of a schoolboy running away to the sea. In the first act of that attempt, he characteristically distinguished himself by becoming the patron saint of stowaways. He never thought of waiting for introductions or bargains or any of the considerable backing that he already had from rich and responsible people. He simply saw a boat and threw himself into it, as he threw himself into everything else. It has all the air of running a race which makes his whole life read like an escapade, or even literally an escape. He lay like lumber among the cargo, with one companion whom he had swept with him in a rush, but the voyage was apparently unfortunate and erratic and ended in an enforced return to Italy. Apparently, it was after this first false start that the great reunion took place, and between this and the final Syrian journey, there was also an attempt to meet the Muslim menace by preaching to the Moors in Spain. In Spain, indeed, several of the first Franciscans had already succeeded gloriously in being martyred, but the great Francis still went about stretching out his arms for such torments and desiring that agony in vain. No one would have said more readily than he that he was probably less like Christ than those others who had already found their cavalry, but the, but the thing remained with him like a secret, the strangest of the sorrows of man. His later voyage was more successful, so far as arriving at the scene of operations was concerned. He arrived at the headquarters of the crusade, which was in front of the besieged city of Damietta, and went on in his rapid and solitary fashion to seek the headquarters of the Saracens, he succeeded in, in obtaining an interview with the sultan, and it was at that interview that he evidently offered, as some say proceeded, to fling himself into the fire as a divine ordeal, defying the Muslim relig religious teachers to do the same. It is quite certain that he would have done so at a moment's notice. Indeed, throwing himself into the fire was hardly more desperate in any case than throwing himself among the weapons and tools of torture of a horde of fanatical Mohammedans and asking them to renounce Mohammed. It is said further that Mohammedan muftis showed some coldness towards the proposed competition, and that one of them would quietly withdrew while it was under discussion, which would also appear credible. But for whatever reason, Francis evidently returned as freely as he came. There may be something in the story of the individual impression produced on the sultan, which the narrator represents as a sort of secret conversion. There may be something in the suggest suggestion that the holy man was unconsciously protected among half-barbarous orientals by the halo of sanctity that is supposed in such places to surround an idiot. 
There is probably as much or more in the more generous explanation of that graceful, though capricious courtesy and compassion which mingled with wilder things in the stately soldans of the type and tradition of Saladin. Finally, there is perhaps something in the suggestion that the tale of St. Francis might be told as a sort of ironic tragedy and comedy called The Man Who Could Not Get Killed. Men liked him too, too much for himself to let him die for his faith, and the man was received instead of a message. But all these things, but all these are only converging guesses at a great effort that is hard to judge, because it broke off short like the beginning of a great bridge that might have united East and West, and remains one of the great might-have-beens of history. And I'll leave off there for today. I hope you enjoyed uh, this little story hour with Catholics Against Militarism. I hope that was somewhat possible for you to follow. Um, and I'll just end with the peace prayer of St. Francis today. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, make me, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless.